Hello, and welcome to my bookshelf. Did you know if you can write, you can make a lot of money? Check the link in the description for more information. Story 10 of The Best American Humorous Short Stories by Alexander Jessup, Editor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 10 The Hotel Experience of Mr. Pink Fluker, 1886, by Richard Malcolm Johnston. From the Century Magazine, June 1886, copyright 1886, by the Century Company, republished in the volume Mr. Absalom Billingsley and Other Georgia Folk, 1888, by Richard Malcolm Johnston, Harper and Brothers. 1. Mr. Peterson Fluker, generally called Pink, for his fondness for as stylish dressing as he could afford, was one of that sort of men who habitually seem busy and efficient when they are not. He had the bustling activity often noticeable in men of his size, and in one way and another had made up, as he believed, for beings so much smaller than most of his adult acquaintance of the male sex. Prominent among his achievements on that line was getting married to a woman who, among other excellent gifts, had that of being twice as big as her husband. Fool who! On the day after his marriage he had asked with a look at those who had often said that he was too little to have a wife. They had a little property to begin with, a couple of hundreds of acres and two or three negroes apiece. Yet, except in the natural increase of the latter, the accretions of worldly estate had been inconsiderable till now, when their oldest child, Moran, was some fifteen years old. These accretions had been saved and taken care of by Mrs. Fluker, who was as staid and silent as he was mobile and voluble. Mr. Fluker often said that it puzzled him how it was that he made smaller crops than most of his neighbors, when, if not always convincing, he could generally put every one of them to silence in discussions upon agricultural topics. This puzzle had led him to not unfrequent ruminations in his mind as to whether or not his vocation might lie in something higher than the mere tilling of the ground. These ruminations had lately taken a definite direction, and it was after several conversations which he had held with his friend Matt Pike. Mr. Matt Pike was a bachelor of some thirty summers, a four-time clerk consecutively in each of the two stores of the village, but latterly a trader on a limited scale in horses, wagons, cows, and similar objects of commerce, and at all times a politician. His hopes of holding office had been continually disappointed until Mr. John Sanks became sheriff and rewarded with a deputyship some important special service rendered by him in the late very close canvas. Now was a chance to rise, Mr. Pike thought. All he wanted, he often said, was a start. Politics, I would remark, however, had been regarded by Mr. Pike as a means rather than an end. It is doubtful if he hoped to become governor of the state, at least before an advanced period in his career. His main object now was to get money, and he believed that official position would promote him in the line of his ambition faster than was possible to any private station, by leading him into more extensive acquaintance with mankind, their needs, their desires, and their caprices. A deputy sheriff, provided that lawyers were not too indulgent in allowing acknowledgment of service of court process, in postponing levies and sales, and in settlement of litigated cases, might pick up three hundred dollars, a good sum for those times, a fact which Mr. Pike had known and pondered long. It happened just about then that the arrears of rent for the village hotel had so accumulated on Mr. Spouter, the last occupant, that the owner, an indulgent man, finally had said what he had been expected for years and years to say, that he could not wait on Mr. Spouter forever and eternally. It was at this very nick, so to speak, 
that Mr. Pike made to Mr. Fluker the suggestion to quit a business so far beneath his powers, sell out, or rent out, or tenant out, or do something else with his farm, march into town, plant himself upon the ruins of Jacob Spouter, and begin his upward soar. Now, Mr. Fluker had many and many a time acknowledged that he had ambition. So one night he said to his wife, "'You see how it is here, Nervy. Farmin' somehow don't suit my talons. I need to be flung more among people to fetch out what's in me. Then thar's Maran, which is getting to be nigh on a growed-up woman, and the child need the society, which you bleed to acknowledge is scarce round here, six mile from town. Your brer Sam can stay here and raise butter, chickens, eggs, pigs, and 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 so forth. Matt Pike say he jest know there's money in it, and special with a housekeeper, careful and economical like you. It is always curious the extent of influence that some men have upon wives who are their superiors. Mrs. Fluker, in spite of accidents, had ever set upon her husband a value that was not recognized outside of his family. In this respect there seems a surprising compensation in human life. But this remark I make only in passing. Mrs. Fluker, admitting in her heart that farming was not her husband's fort, hoped, like a true wife, that it might be found in a new field to which he aspired. Besides, she did not forget that her brother Sam had said to her several times privately that if his brer Pink wouldn't have so many notions and would let him alone in his management, they would all do better. She reflected for a day or two, and then said, "'Maybe it's best, Mr. Fluker. I'm willing to try it for a year anyhow. We can't lose much by that. As for Matt Pike, I hain't the confidence in him you has. Still, he bein' a boarder and deputy sheriff, he might accidentally do us some good. I'll try it for a year, providin' you'll fetch me the money as it's paid in, for you know I know how to manage that better than you do, and you know I'll try to manage it and all the rest of the business for the best. To this provision Mr. Fluker gave consent qualified by the claim that he was to retain a small margin for indispensable personal exigencies, for he contended, perhaps with justice, that no man in the responsible position he was about to take ought to be expected to go about, or sit about, or even lounge about, without even a continental red in his pocket. The new house, I say new because tongue could not tell the amount of scouring, scalding, and whitewashing that that excellent housekeeper had done before a single stick of her furniture went into it. The new house, I repeat, opened with six eating boarders at ten dollars a month apiece, and two eating and sleeping at eleven, besides Mr. Pike, who made a special contract transient custom was hoped to hold its own, and that of the county people under the deputy's patronage and influence to be considerably enlarged. In words and other encouragement Mr. Pike was pronounced. He could commend honestly. He did so cordially. The thing to do, Pink, is to have your prices regular and make people pay up regular. Ten dollars for eatin' just so. Eleven for eatin' and sleepin', half a dollar for dinner, just so. Quarter apiece for breakfast, supper, and bed is what I call reasonable board. As for me, I scarcely know how to regulate, because, you know, I'm an officer now, and in course I natural has to be away sometimes, and on expenses at other places, and it seems like some allowance ought by good rights to be made for that, don't you think so? why matter of course matt what do you think i ain't so powerful good at figures nervy is supposin you speak to her about it oh that's perfect unuseless pink i'm an officer of the law pink and the law consider women well i may say the law she deal with men not women and she expect her officers to understand figures and if i hadn't uh, understood figures Mr. Sanks wouldn't or darn't to pint me his deputy. Me and you can fix them terms. 
Now, see here, reg'lar board eatin' board, I mean is ten dollars and sleepin', and single meals is 'cordin' to the figgers you've sot fer 'em. Ain't that so?" "Jes so." "Now, Pink, you and me keep a runnin' account, you a chargin' fer reg'lar board, and I allowin' to myself credits fer my absences, accordin' to transion customers, and single mealers and sleepers. Is that far, or is it not far?" Mr. Fluker turned his head, and after making, or thinking he had made, a calculation, answered, "'That's, uh, that seems far, Matt.' "'Certainly tis, Pink. I knowed you'd say so, and you know I'd never wish to be nothing but far with people I like, like I do you and your wife. Let that be the understanding, then, betwixt us. And, Pink, let the understanding be just betwixt us, for I've saw enough of this world to find out that a man never makes nothing by making a blowin' horn of his business. You make the t'others pay up punctual monthly. You and me can settle whensoever it's convenient, say three months from to-day. In course, I shall talk up for the house whensoever and whysoever I go or stay. You know that. And as for my bed, said Mr. Pike finally, Whensomever I ain't here by bedtime, you welcome to put any transient person in it, and also, and likewise, when transient custom is pressin' and you cramp for beddin', I'm willin' to give it up for the time bein'. And rather than you should be cramped too bad, I'll take my chances somewheres else, even if I has to take a pallet at the head of the star steps. Nervy, said Mr. Fluker to his wife afterwards, Matt Pike's a sensibler and a friendlier and a accommodatinger feller, I thought. Then, without giving details of the contract, he mentioned merely the willingness of their boarder to resign his bed on occasions of pressing emergency. He's talked mighty fine to me and Maran, answered Mrs. Fluker. We'll see how he holds out. One thing I do not like of his doing, and that's the talking about Sim Marchman to Maran and making game o' his country ways, as he call em, such as that ain't right. It may be as well to explain just here that Simeon Marchman, the person just named by Mrs. Fluker, a stout, industrious young farmer, residing with his parents in the country near by where the Flukers had dwelt before removing to town, had been eyeing Maran for a year or two, and waiting upon her fast-ripening womanhood, with intentions that he believed to be hidden in his own breast, though he had taken less pains to conceal them from Aran than from the rest of his acquaintance. Not that he had ever told her of them in so many words, but, oh, I need not stop here in the midst of this narration to explain how such intentions become known, or at least strongly suspected by girls, even those less bright than Maran Fluker. Simeon had not cordially endorsed the movement into town, though, of course, knowing it was none of his business, he had never so much as hinted opposition. I would not be surprised also if he reflected that there might be some selfishness in his hostility, or at least that it was heightened by apprehensions personal to himself. Considering the want of experience in the new tenants, matters went on remarkably well. Mrs. Fluker, accustomed to rise from her couch long before the lark, managed to the satisfaction of all, regular boarders, single meal-takers, and transient people. Maran went to the village school, her mother dressing her, though with prudent economy, as neatly and almost as tastefully as any of her schoolmates, while as to study, deportment, and general progress, there was not a girl in the whole school to beat her. I don't care who she was. 2. During a not inconsiderable period, Mr. Fluker indulged the honourable conviction that at last he had found the vein in which his best talents lay, and he was happy, in foresight of the prosperity and felicity which that discovery promised to himself and his family. His native activity found many more objects for its exertion than before. He rode out to the farm, not often, but sometimes, as a matter of duty, and was forced to acknowledge that Sam was managing better than could have been expected in the absence of his own continuous guidance. In town he walked about the hotel, 
entertained the guests, carved at the meals, hovered about the stores, the doctor's offices, the wagon and blacksmith shops, discussed mercantile, medical, mechanical questions with specialists in all these departments, throwing into them all more and more of politics as the intimacy between him and his patrons and chief boarder increased. Now, as to that patron and chief boarder, the need of extending his acquaintance seemed to press upon Mr. Pike with ever-increasing weight. He was here and there, all over the county, at the county seat, at the county villages, at justices' courts, at executors' and administrators' sales, at quarterly and protracted religious meetings, at barbecues of every dimension, on hunting excursions and fishing frolics, at social parties in all neighborhoods. It got to be said of Mr. Pike that a freer acceptor of hospitable invitations or a better appreciator of hospitable intentions was not and needed not to be found possibly in the whole state. Nor was this admirable deportment confined to the county in which he held so high official position. He attended, among other occasions less public, the spring sessions of the Supreme and County Courts in the four adjoining counties, the guest of acquaintance old and new over there. When starting upon such travels, he would sometimes breakfast with his traveling companion in the village, and, if somewhat belated in the return, sup with him also. Yet when at Fluker's, no man could have been a more cheerful and otherwise satisfactory boarder than Mr. Matt Pike. He praised every dish set before him, bragged to their very faces of his host and hostess, and, in spite of his absences, was the oftenest to sit and chat with Moran when her mother would let her go into the parlor. Here and everywhere about the house, in the dining-room, in the passage, at the foot of the stairs, he would joke with Moran about her country beau, as he styled poor Sim Marchman, and he would talk as though he was rather ashamed of Sim, and wanted Moran to string her bow for higher game. Brer Sam did manage well, not only the fields, but the yard. Every Saturday of the world he sent in something or other to his sister. I don't know whether I ought to tell it or not, but for the sake of what is due to pure veracity I will. On as many as three different occasions Sim Marchman, as if he had lost all self-respect, or had not a particle of tact, brought in himself, instead of sending by a negro, a bucket of butter and a coop of spring chickens as a free gift to Mrs. Fluker. I do think, on my soul, that Mr. Matt Pike was much amused by such degradation. However, he must say that they were all first-rate. As for Moran, she was very sorry for Sim, and wished he had not brought these good things at all. Nobody knew how it came about, but when the Flukers had been in town somewhere between two and three months, Sim Marchman, who, to use his own words, had never bothered her a great deal with his visits, began to suspect that what few he made were received by Moran lately with less cordiality than before. And so one day, knowing no better, in his awkward, straightforward country manners, he wanted to know the reason why. Then Moran grew distant, and asked Sim the following question. "'You know where Mr. Pike's gone, Mr. Marchman?' Now the fact was, and she knew it, that Moran Fluker had never before, not since she was born, addressed that boy as Mr. The visitor's face reddened and reddened. "'No,' he faltered and answered. "'No, no, ma'am, I should say. I, I don't know where Mr. Pike's gone.' Then he looked around for his hat, discovered it in time, took it into his hands, turned it around two or three times, then bidding good-bye without shaking hands, took himself off. Mrs. Fluker liked all the Marchmans, and she was troubled somewhat when she heard of the quickness and manner of Sim's departure, for he had been fully expected by her to stay to dinner. "'Say he didn't even shake hands, Moran? What for?' what you'd do to him. Not one blessed thing, Ma, only he wanted to know why I wasn't gladder to see him. 
Then Moran looked indignant. "'Say them words, Moran?' "'No, but he hinted them. "'What did you say, then?' "'I just ask, a meanin' nothin' in the wide world, Ma. "'I asked him if he knew where Mr. Pike had gone. "'And that was answer enough to hurt his feelings. "'What you want to know where Matt Pike's gone for, Moran?' "'I didn't care about knowin', Ma, but I didn't like the way Sim talked. "'Listen here, Moran. Look straight at me.' You'll be mighty fur off your feet if you let Matt Pike put things in your head that ain't no business to be in there, and special if you find yourself a want to know where he's a perambulatin' in his everlastin' meanderings. Not a cent has he paid for his board, and which your pa say he have a understanding with him about allowin' for his absentees, which is all right enough, but which is now goin' on to three months and what is coming to us I need and I want. He ought, your pa ought to let me bargain with Matt Pike, because he know he don't understand figures like Matt Pike. He don't know exactly what the bargains were, for I've asked him, and he always begins with a multiplying of words and never answers me. On his next return from his travels, Mr. Pike noticed a coldness in Mrs. Fluker's manner, and this enhanced his praise of the house. The last week of the third month came. Mr. Pike was often noticed, before and after meals, standing at the desk at the hotel office, called in those times the bar-room, engaged in making calculations. The day before the contract expired, Mrs. Fluker, who had not indulged herself with a single holiday since they had been in town, left Moran in charge of the house and rode forth spending part of the day with Mrs. Marchman, Sim's mother. All were glad to see her, of course, and she returned smartly, freshened by the visit. That night she had a talk with Moran, and, oh, how Moran did cry! The very last day came. Like insurance policies, the contract was to expire at a certain hour. Sim Marchman came just before dinner, to which he was sent for by Mrs. Fluker, who had seen him as he rode into town. "'Hello, Sim,' said Mr. Pike, as he took his seat opposite him. "'You here? What's the news in the country? How's your health? How's crops?' "'Just moderate, Mr. Pike. Got little business with you after dinner, effin' you can spare time.' "'All right. Got a little matter with Pink here first. Twon't take long. See you after immediate, Sim.' Never had the deputy been more gracious and witty. He talked and talked, out-talking even Mr. Fluker. He was the only man in town who could do that. He winked at Moran as he put questions to Sim, some of the words employed in which Sam had never heard before. Yet Sim held up as well as he could, and after dinner followed Moran with some dignity into the parlor. They had not been there more than ten minutes when Mrs. Fluker was heard to walk rapidly along the passage leading from the dining-room, to enter her own chamber for only a moment, then to come out and rush to the parlour door with the gig-whip in her hand. Such uncommon conduct in a woman like Mrs. Pink Fluker, of course, needs explanation. When all the other boarders had left the house, the deputy and Mr. Fluker, having repaired to the bar-room, the former said, "'Now, Pink, for our settlement, as you say your wife thinks we better have one. I'd have been willin' to let accounts keep on a-runnin', knowin' what a straightforward sort of man you was. Your account, if I ain't mistaken, is just thirty-three dollars, even money. Is that so, or is it not?' "'That's it, to a dollar, Matt. Three times eleven make thirty-three, don't it?' "'It do, Pink, or eleven times three, just which you please.' Now here's my count, on which you'll see, Pink, that not nary cent have I charged for influence. I has influenced a considerable custom to this house, as you know, boardin' and transient. But I done that out of my respects of you and Mrs. Fluker, and your keepin' of a far, I'll say, as I said, frequent, a very far house. I let them influences go to friendship, if you'll take it so. Will you, Pink Fluker? "'Certainly, Matt, and I'm a thousand times obliged to you, and say no more, Pink, on that point of view. If I like a man, I know how to treat him. Now, as to the pints uh, absentees, 
My business as dep'ty sheriff has took me away from this inconsider'ble town frequent, ain't it?" "It have, Matt, or something else more'n I were expectin', and—" "Jes' so. But a public officer pink when jooty call on him to go, he got to go. In fack, he got to goeth, as the Scripture say. Ain't that so?" "I s'pose so, Matt, by good rights, a—a—'ficial speakin'." Mr. Fluker felt that he was becoming a little confused. "Jes' so. Now, Pink, I were to have credics for my absentees accordin' to transion' and single meal boarders and sleepers. Ain't that so?" "I—I—somethin' o' that sort, Matt," he answered vaguely. "Jes' so. Now, look here," drawn from his pocket a paper, "item one. Twenty-eight dinners at half a dollar makes fourteen dollars, don't it?" "Jes' so." Twenty-five breakfasts at a quarter makes six and a quarter, which make dinners and breakfasts twenty and a quarter. Foller me up as I go, Pink. Twenty-five suppers at a quarter makes six and a quarter, and which them added to the twenty and a quarter makes them twenty-six and a half. Foller, Pink, and if you catch me in any mistakes in the carryin' and addin', pint it out. Twenty-two and a half beds, and I'll say half, Pink, because you remember one night when them Augusty lawyers got here about midnight on their way to a court, rather than have you too bad cramped, I rise to make way for two of em. Yet, as I had one good nap, I didn't think I ought to put that down but for half. Them makes five dollars half and seven pence, and which carried on to the t'other twenty-six and a half, fetches the whole caboodle to just thirty-two dollars and seven pence. But I made up my mind I'd fling out that seven pence and just call it a dollar even money, and which here's the solid silver. In spite of the rapidity with which this enumeration of countercharges was made, Mr. Fluker commenced perspiring at the first item, and when the balance was announced his face was covered with huge drops. It was at this juncture that Mrs. Fluker, who, well knowing her husband's unfamiliarity with complicated accounts, had felt her duty to be listening near the barroom door, left and quickly afterwards appeared before Moran and Sim, as I have represented. "'You think Matt Pike ain't trying to settle with your pa with a dollar? I'm going to make him keep his dollar, and I'm going to give him something to go along with it.' "'The good Lord have mercy upon us!' exclaimed Moran, springing up and catching hold of her mother's skirt, as she began her advances towards the barroom. "'Oh, Ma, for the Lord's sake! Sim, 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 if you care anything for me in this wide world, don't let Ma go into that room!' "'Mrs. Fluker,' said Sim, rising instantly, "'wait just two minutes till I see Mr. Pike on some pressin' business. I won't keep you over two minutes a waitin.' He took her, set her down on a chair trembling, looking at her a moment as she began to weep, then going out and closing the door, strode rapidly to the bar-room. "'Let me help you settle your board bill, Mr. Pike, by paying you a little one I owe you.' Doubling his fist, he struck out with a blow that felled the deputy to the floor. Then, catching him by his heels, he dragged him out of the house into the street. Lifting his foot above his face, he said, "'You stir till I tell you.' and I'll stomp your nose down even with the balance of your mean face. Tain't exactly my business how you cheated, Mr. Fluker, though pon my soul I never allowed a trefliner low-downer trick. But I owed you myself for your talking about, and your lying about me. And now I've paid you, and if you only knowed it, I've saved you from a gig whipping. Now you may get up. Here's his dollar, Sim, said Mr. Fluker, throwing it out of the window. Nervy says make him take it. The vanquished, not daring to refuse, pocketed the coin and slunk away amid the jeers of a score of villagers who had been drawn to the scene. In all human probability, the late omissions of the shaking of Sims and Moran's hands was compensated at their parting that afternoon. I am more confident on this point, because at the end of the year those hands were joined inseparably by the preacher. But this was when they had all gone back to their old home. For if Mr. Fluker did not become fully convinced that his mathematical education was not advanced quite enough for all the exigencies of hotel-keeping, 
his wife declared that she had had enough of it, and that she and Moran were going home. Mr. Fluker may be said, therefore, to have followed, rather than led, his family on the return. As for the deputy, finding that if he did not leave it voluntarily he would be drummed out of the village, he departed, whither I do not remember if anybody ever knew. End of Story 10 Thank you for listening. Please subscribe, like, and share.